Well, I'd like to give you all a warm welcome on this beautiful Sabbath afternoon in Bering Springs, Michigan. We'd like to welcome all of our online viewers watching at home and around the world uh, to the afternoon program in our Religious Liberty Sabbath here on the 16th of January, 2021. God has blessed us so far as we've gone through this day together. Uh, our Religious Liberty Sabbath here at Village Church is put together by our Religious Liberty Committee. And I'd like to pause and say thank you to the members of our committee who put so much work and effort and prayer into bringing you our annual Religious Liberty Sabbath. We're going to start out today with a word of prayer. Uh, followed by that, we will have two songs by the Sun Coast Singers uh, to draw us into the presence of our Heavenly Father. Following that, their singing, uh, we'll have a presentation by Dr. John Markovich, who is a historian. He serves at Andrews University. And he's going to be sharing with us about the Chinese Cultural Revolution and lessons for Christians today. The Cultural Revolution happened within many of our lifetimes. It's within living memory. And there are many lessons that we can learn today as we see what is happening around us in 2021. So wherever you are, I invite you to bow your heads with me and we'll open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath. We thank you, Father, that one day we'll worship you face to face in the new Jerusalem. And Father, until that day, I pray that your spirit will never cease to strive with us, to convict us of sin and of our need of Jesus, our sin-bearing Savior. Father, as we gather here today in your house on your day, I pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you will anoint the singers as they minister to us in song in the next few moments. I pray that your Holy Spirit will descend upon Dr. Markovich as he gives us the first presentation today. And upon the subsequent presentations, Father, may you be glorified in all that is said and done. Father, you gave gifts to your church for the equipping of the body of Christ. And we ask that whatever is said and sung today will equip ourselves and brothers and sisters for a reinvigorated ministry in whichever portion of the vineyard you've called them to live and serve. So, Father, we give the rest of today into your hands. Protect this building with your angels. Watch over our loved ones. And may your spirit be the only spirit dwelling within these four walls. Thank you for hearing this prayer, because we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. We're going to sing two songs that relate to the subject of our meetings here today, uh, Religious Liberty. Um, the first is an old hymn, Faith is the Victory that Overcomes the World. And the second is a newer song, Let Freedom Ring. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and armor to the fray. Salvation's helm head on each head with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the whole white raiment shall begin. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith, Faith is the victory. Faith, Faith is the victory. Oh, glory. 
glorious victory that overcomes the world.
The People's Republic of China was proclaimed in fall, fall 1949. 32 years prior, the Bolsheviks took over a Russian government and established a communist state as well. Few months after 1945, few months after the proclamation of China's Rep uh, Repu People's Republic of China, the new state entered into formal alliance with the Soviet Union. Mao Zedong is the chief architect of Chinese communism. What uh, Lenin, then later Stalin, meant for the Soviet communism, that is what Mao Zedong means for Chinese communism. Since the peasants, Chinese peasants, made up approximately 90% of population in 1940s, Mao concluded that the only way to bring communism to China was to rely on the revolutionary peasantry. Why is this important to know? According to World Bank, almost 20% of Chinese population lived in urban areas in 1980, which is about 40 years ago. In 2019, according to World Bank, the number of urban population rose to 60%. Why is this important? Because urban population is consumer population. Peasant population always, all through centuries, was kept and it lived at the subsistence level. Consumer population produces or triggers or creates a strong economy. Strong economy and wealth translates into military power. Just keep that in mind. In the three, first three years of governing, Mao's regime expropriated the land from the landlords who were either killed or imprisoned. The land was first redistributed to peasants, but then within about five years, six from 1955 to 57, it was collectivized in a very similar process as the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union have done. Initially in the Soviet Union, the land was taken away from nobility, distributed to the peasants, and then collectivized in the, uh, around 1930. The most likely uh, this happened most likely because many peasants welcomed, um, no, okay, I'm sorry. The resistance in the rural, rural area was not as fierce as it was in the Soviet Union. This is most likely because many peasants welcomed Mao's regime and because in Chinese tradition, the central government in Beijing is always considered authoritative. The new communes, communal way of life, became a basis of Chinese peasant life. The communes soon proved to be uh, inefficient and disastrous. One factor is that communes were usually about 25,000 persons. That's like a um, large, small town, difficult to manage, and keep in mind that people who were appointed to manage communes were always, uh, appointment was based on the participation belonging to the party rather to qualifications and ability to manage. During the first de decade, Mao's government, the Soviet model was the blueprint uh, of Chinese economy. In 1953, the, Stalin died 
That's March 5, 1953. In that year, Ma Mao introduced the first five-year plan. It was successful, like in the Soviet Union, the first five-year plan actually was achieved in four years. Now, first five-year plan, first five plans, first five-year plans are usually successful for the simple reasons they are starting from scratch. Um, by 1956, Nikita Khrushchev established himself in power in the Soviet Union, and at the 20th Party Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, on February 25, 1956, in a secret speech to the Congress, Khrushchev denounced and condemned Stalin, Stalin's policies and Stalin's, quote, crimes. That secret speech, in a very short time, somehow was uh, um, made available to the West, and it became public. Khrushchev's criticism of Stalin and his harsh policies did not sit well with Mao. Um, because Mao pretty much followed Stalin's pattern of behavior and Stalin's policies. But Mao also believed that he, as a senior communist leader, and he perceived himself being senior to Khrushchev, he believed that the mantle of Lenin-Stalin should somehow be passed unto him. So there was uh, some personal jealousy on his part. At the same time, Mao was becoming impatient with the Soviet model, and in 1958, he introduced the so-called Great Leap Forward policy. It is an accelerated version of the five-year plan. It was an attempt of massive and overnight industrialization. The endeavor, the endeavor was costly and failed miserably. His mentors in Moscow criticized him and in the meantime, Khrushchev's secret public speech became also perceived by many, and Mao was afraid of that, a criticism of his policies. Then came the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, where the Soviets were forced to cave in in face of the American resolve to stop the Soviets installing nuclear heads in Cuba. Mao was interested and he wanted to see a clash between the Soviets and the Americans because he was way more revolutionary and his revolutionary zeal was much stronger than what was actually happening in Moscow. He derided the Moscow leadership, Moscow leadership's fear of, quote, paper tigers. In the years to come, Mao began to believe that the Soviet revolution has been suffocated by bureaucratization. And he decided that he would not allow the same to take place in China. He began to notice how his own communist comrades were gradually settling into their own respective careers and positions, and he feared that they would soon lose the revolutionary zeal. That's pretty much the same feeling what Stalin sensed in the early 1930s, and eventually led to the great purges in Soviet Union. Um, as he was preparing, uh, he also, Mao also feared that possible rivals may appear within the, within the party. 
As he was preparing to somehow rejuvenate the party with a renewed revolutionary zeal, he found out that Beijing, which is kind of has that traditional respectability in the part of the population at large, that somehow Beijing is controlled by the inside adversaries, adversaries. And he, he eventually turns to his supporters in the second largest city of China, Shanghai. In 1964, he wrote the following, quote, we cannot take the old path of technical development followed by various countries of the world and go at, at a crawl after other people. We must break with the convention and make maximum use of advanced techniques so that our country can be built into a modern socialist power within not too long and a historical period. That is the same sentiment that Stalin in the late 1920s told his people that we, his, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, we are approximately 100 years behind the West and we must make it in 10. How do you do that? In 1965, Mao made a call for a cultural revolution. In May 1966, helped with a small group of his young and radical supporters, the newly formed, he, and he created, with his leadership, they created a small number of people, uh, a cultural revolution group. And that, that group was about 15, 20 individuals. And what is very interesting that one of those 15, 20 individuals was his, his own second wife, uh, Jiang Jing, uh, and some other revolutionaries. Notice that Mao turns to younger generation. Again, very similar pattern that Stalin did as well. He all, Stalin also turned to the younger generation to replace it, to replace uh, uh, the old generation, the old Bolsheviks, um, because Stalin believed that only with those Bolsheviks, those communists, those um, members of the Communist Party who were born after 1917, or let's say born maybe a few years earlier, but they grew up during the civil war, of Russian civil war and after, not uh, older generation who already lived and experienced and had some sense of pre-1917 uh, society. The Cultural Revolution was an officially inspired anarchy for all practical purposes. Professors were publicly humiliated Learned doctors, physicians, they were made to scrub the floors of their own hospitals. Scholars were abused for having foreign language books in their private libraries. Communist party secretaries were accused of sabotage. Fic factional fighting of all kinds was allowed and encouraged, sometimes even in the streets. The economy again suffered Managers and skilled personnel were sent to the village to learn lessons of the revolution. They were forced to sweep barns, to dig potatoes. The only qualification for promotion was to memorize the thoughts of Chairman Mao, which are immortalized in the little red book that they used to wave and uh, so on, you probably saw that in the images on TV. By 1969, the anarchy was so bad that Ma Mao had to call back the Red Guards and that those are the youthful groups, pro uh, something like militia, um, and put the army in charge of everyday affairs. The Cultural Revolution was huge setback for China. 
and it had similar effects that had been felt for at least a generation, as it was the case with the great purges in the 19, from 1934 to 1938 in the Soviet Union. Um, in point of fact, Mao's behavior in many ways followed the pattern of Stalin. And, um, and Chinese political party pretty much kind of fo followed uh, what was happening in the Soviet Union before. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, the, the year of the proclamation of the communist state in China versus communist state in Russia is about 32 years. It's about a whole generation. Uh, and that's also important to keep in mind when we talk about our present situation, what's going on here. Um, you'll see why. Um, the Cultural Revolution was actually, in point in fact, is Mao's way of trying to survive politically, as Stalin used the great purchase to do the same. Um, ironically, the same thing happens after Stalin's death. Khrushchev and the communists, the entire party, pretty much distant, distant themselves from Stalin and Khrushchev in his secret speech condemned Stalin, Stalin's policies, and Stalin's crimes. Ironically, the same thing happens to Mao in the Cultural Revolution after his death. Within a week of Mao's death, September 9, 1976, his ambitions and hatred, uh, his ambitious and hated wife and her three close associates, members of that um, 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 the revolution, uh, great revolution, uh, cultural revolution group of these, you know, they also were, um, and matter of fact, uh, his wife and three associates, they were referred to in our media as the gang of four, they were imprisoned and eventually the new generation, post-Mao generation, began to rehabilitate all those individuals, party members who were falsely accused, sent to prison, and so on. Now, a similar case, what, when we talk about the great cultural, revolu cultural revolution in China, we have similar things happening during the so-called war communism in the Soviet Union. War communism lasted between 1918 and 1921. At the same time, the civil war in Russia between the, the, Red, Ar the Red Army forces, the Bolsheviks, and on the other side, the so-called White Armies, collection of monarchies, Republicans, Democrats, pro-Westerners, and uh, so at the same time as the civil war was going on, war communism was being implemented. And then during the 1930s, uh, the same thing was going. In order to achieve their objectives, Stalin and Mao as well, they were willing to sacrifice and, um, and literally destroy millions of human beings just to achieve their objective and to survive politically and to preserve their um, communist regime. Now, what is very interesting to me as I am observing this whole situation, what is going on today with us, um, it is interesting that Communist, Chinese communism or Chinese communist state was about a generation later than the Soviet communist system or communist state. 
And eventually the uh, Soviet communist state collapsed in 1991. The Chinese communist state still exists. And when we speak of the Cold War and if, if you bring that topic, the audience immediately thinks about the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. Supposedly that Cold War ended in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But all throughout that period, and it is considered that Cold War started approximately 1943, 1945, during the closing years of the Second World War. And ever since then, um, American policies were the policies of strategic containment of Soviet communism and I assume the Soviet state, the expansion of the Soviet state, or the influence of the Soviet state. It's interesting that if, even in 1993, the Vatican leadership was willing and actually made a concordat with Nazi Germany in 1933. The Vatican was willing to make an agreement with Nazi Germany in order to somehow combat Soviet or Moscow communism. And that, that fear of Moscow communism was actually, uh, they would rather, uh, 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 the Vatican would rather, and um, at that time, Cardio uh, Pacelli was uh, uh, Secretary of State who actually signed its agreement. So the Vatican leadership was willing, rather, to make an alliance with the Nazis in order to fight the Bolsheviks. Because the Bolsheviks were perceived as the worst enemy of the Catholic Church and by extension of Christianity. That hatred and resistance to the Soviet Union is still translating even today into relationship vis a United States relationship with Russia, which is a state which inherited legal rights of the Soviet Union, but drastically changed from what it used to be. Russia today is not a communist state. All those communist leaders, somehow by miracle, in the late 1980s and 1990s became Westerners and believers and, and uh, so on. They became capitalists, took over uh, economy and so on. It is interesting to keep that in mind. And also in the 1970s, we have one big event taking place which is only now beginning to take importance, and that is when in February 1972, American President Richard Nixon made a visit to China. And um, that visit is now beginning to show somehow ramifications for all these years. And what is interesting to me to watch is that our government has made peace with China. But China also changed drastically after Mao, Mao, Mao's uh, death because it, uh, it stopped 
seemingly, apparently, it stopped the state-controlled economy and adopted something like a Western free market economy, but it is still controlled by the state, by the party. And what's interesting to me is that that reapproachment was somehow taken as China is our friend. And for the years, as time was passing by, yes, um, many American corporations and companies made a lot of money with that relationship. Because when China eventually becomes part of the World Trade Organization in 2001, and when China opened up in the 70s and especially in the 80s to welcome Western um, capitalism, China was work warehouse of cheap labor. The Soviet Union, Russia was not that. And um, 2001, by now, Chinese population is, as I mentioned before, 60% urban. It is the second largest, if not approaching to become the largest economy in the world. Second largest to the United States. Some people even argue that it's probably right there on par, and who knows, if it were not for this uh, pandemic, maybe it would surpass the U.S. economy in the near future. And what I see is that 2016 election brought in a populist man into the government. Trump was a disruptor of that whole course that was going on for a number of decades. And I think that now, if I, I keep, we keep in mind that after all, God is in charge. And according to Paul, God establishes, or not establish, God lets people be a government, what kind of governments he lets it go. He uses those people and so on. So what happened with Trump was, from the very beginning, my position was that he's an outsider. He will not last long because the system was too big and too strong. And he had to go. For four years, they tried to get rid of him, and eventually he is defeated. Now, what does that all mean for us and our religious freedom? In my classes as I teach world history, my survey courses, I always point out to my students that when the founding fathers in the 18th century established this particular republic, and the way they structure the government, it is not popular democracy, it is a democratic republic where the rule of law rules. And where majority governs, but the rights of minorities are protected by the structure of the government. In other words, the majority may not come up with laws which will be curtailing the basic rights of the minority. And when I tell my students, when you look at the long history of humanity, no other country has come up with such a, such a form of government. It was the best human beings could develop and come up with. 
Now what we are witnessing is that very structure of the government is being attacked. And, it, and some people promised to take it apart. And the fundamental principle of all freedoms that were uh, uh, proposed and uh, propagated and talked about and fought for and people died for it during the Enlightenment age, 16th, 17th, 18th century, is the freedom, not only freedom to assemble, freedom to publish, freedom to um, what um, um, to assemble, to publish, to and the most important is freedom of conscience and freedom, religious freedom. That's the most important, religious freedom. To believe, uh, to live according to your conscience. To believe whatever you want to believe and to to be protected, that people have no right, the state has no right to restrict that freedom and to force you into behaving in the way that you believe you should not, or you should, and so on. And that freedom is being, it publicly has been stated, already has been uh, stated this morning um, by Conrad Wine, I, that Some people have already pointed out that we cannot use religion to excuse ourselves from, quote, discriminating against certain groups of people. Another important event that we should take place, that we should keep in mind, is I am also surprised to see that that same Vatican which was dead opposed to Soviet communism, is today welcoming Chinese communism, willing to work and cooperate together. My closing thoughts are, as we are witnessing this, and uh, I don't know, much of this talk may give us problems in the, year, in the days to come. Uh, persecution, you know, we Adventists talk about persecution to come. Persecution is already here. Are you aware of that? We are already being persecuted. Well, not you and I, but persecution is already taking place. There is already calls by the people that will be in the government in a few days to, and not only by the government people, but even by other agencies, to uh, ostracize, to marginalize, to debar to certain individuals. And uh, actually a war is going on to completely destroy what we call those who are connected or are conservatives. In my opinion is that Christians who are not Seventh-day Adventists, they also have to go through persecutions. At every step in our lives, we have to make a choice. Are you going to go this way or that way? And many of conservatives out there will eventually have to, they have to make those choices. We, are, we Adventists, along the way, will also become part of that persecuted group, but we are going to be persecuted to the end, and it will be more fierce and fierce and probably in the end, the Sabbath issue will become the defining factor, the last, the last choice. You go this way or that way. So it is somewhat, what is happening is somewhat frightening. 
it is somewhat alarming, but we should not take, when we speak of these things, we should not take this as a trying to instill fear in us, because turning to God out of fear is questionable. But, uh, you should not fear God. We should take it more as a warning or maybe just a, um, this is descriptive, this is what's happening in society. Uh, matter of fact, may, it may be strange to say, but I am somewhat glad that this is happening. It's about time. Um, we talk about it, and uh, one, one leading line of Lenin was in his days, because Lenin kind of rejected one aspect of Marx. Marx believed that capitalism has to ripen, capitalism has to die in order the proletariat to come out. Lenin said, uh, well, since uh, proletarian revolution is inevitable, that's the key term, inevitable. And he said, why wait, let's do it now. Push history a little bit. Since the second coming is inevitable, why are we so afraid of these things? I mean, it has to come, let it come. It's gonna be tough and difficult and painful, um, but what else can we do? But now, in this situation, as we are being persecuted, I think it is very important for us to begin to think, how are we thinking of those who persecute us? How do you speak of them? How do we treat them? Are you willing to say like Jesus and some martyrs of the past have prayed and say, God, help them. They don't know what they're doing. How do we position ourselves in a situation when we find some of our Christian friends who are not Seventh-day Adventists and they are persecuted? What do we say about them, to them? How do we see ourselves? And so on. Because these are the issues that uh, are very important. If I have, can I have five minutes more? Maybe six, seven, ten. I would like to add to something uh, Conrad, you spoke about, uh, you mentioned and spoke a little bit about totalitarian regimes. Because I teach uh, I've, about these totalitarian regimes in the past and all of that. Over the years, I had come up with a number of characteristics of a totalitarian regime. Because uh, to, in, order for, in order for a state to be, or society to become totalitarian, it needs to have certain things set in place in order to achieve that. Because it's not easy to control entire society in totality. That's very difficult. And uh, num what, what state needs is technology. During the Middle Ages, the church attempted to control population. It could not. It did as much as it could, but it could not because lack of technology. Hitler, Stalin, they tried also to control population in total. We, what we mean by that is that no aspect of your existence, of your life, is free from the control of the state. That's what it means. Co you are controlled totally. But Hitler and Stalin did not have technology we have today. 
it is technology which is enables people in power to control the population in total. So there is always a degree to what degree a state can control the population. Now, there are a number of things that must be. And I'm going to skip number one, and that, that I usually have it on my list here, and I'll bring, bring, uh, bring it up later. Number two, one single political party. There has to be one political party. Now, that doesn't have to be, because totalitarian regimes do not copy each other through history. There are always changes and so on. So, uh, for example, I don't believe that Nazi Germany type totalitarian regimes or Stalin communist totalitarian regime will replicate itself. Exactly, no. But a lot of things will change, but things will... So we may have two-party system in this country, but one party can easily be kind of uh, neutralized. And there's a possibility. I don't, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but there is a possibility. Big possibility that we can become one party with one party irrelevant. One official ideology. It doesn't have to be the state ideology. It can be cultural, social, the masses. Look what happened just in the last few weeks. We have CEOs of few corporations, companies, who are virtually shutting us down. What you may say and what you may know and what you may read. Don't be fooled. We don't use the word propaganda. We have different terms for that management of information. And that's happening in our country too. Um, complete control of judicial system. Everyone is under suspicion. State police. Monopoly over education, educational system. We still have private education but even private education is heavily monitored by accreditation agencies. Monopoly over the communication system, well, we, that's what we see going on today. Monopoly over arms and weapons. That's a really touchy feature. What is very much embedded in American culture which goes back to the 18th century, is the freedom to own arms and weapons. And this is where it will be a big struggle between the government, how to neutralize that, how to take that. And I, that to me is interesting to watch what will happen and how it will uh, um, develop in the years to come. No other Western state has this, that citizens are allowed to, you know, go and buy guns and, and arms and so on. Monopoly over economy, or just think about um, what we have here about climate change, climate crisis. That's not just to, let's say, clean up the air and so on. Um, it is also controlling commerce, um, several industries, transport industry, commerce, uh, oil industry, and energy, and all of that, that's slowly overtaking economy. Individual rights are subordinated to the needs of the state. The rights of individuals, and this is one of the major features of the Enlightenment age, that, which is, I also believe, biblical principle. Individual, right of individuals are extremely important. Even God, 
deals with each one of us individually. The fact that you belong to a church, an organization, institution, or any group doesn't save you. You stand before God as well as I stand before God as an individual. And when it comes to this, that it's those rights are subordinated to the needs of the state, that's another feature, characteristic. And then you have this uh, social and private issues are simplified. And listen, when you listen to politicians, politicians like to simplify things in order to make slogans. And people fall for it. Well, my friends, life is way more complex. Issues in our society are very complex. And then, not only that they are simplified, but they are politicized. For example, sexuality is a private issue. But it ha has become politicized. Religion is a private issue, but it will be politicized, and it is already being politicized slowly. And then the first one, which is probably the most, how should I say, the bottom fundamental principle of totalitarian regimes is... Um, You were just, Conrad, you were this morning just about to use that, prince, that phrase, and you did not. So you saved my day. And that is the principle of the end justifies the means. I want, that's what a young generation today, I want to have that. I, can, I hear that even from small children today, four, seven, eight years, I, my grandchildren often. I want that. I, just because I want it. I'm not surprised more and more when I ask my students, how to, you know, if you are in a situation where you have to decide what's right and wrong, on what basis, how do you decide? Do you know what is the most common answer I get? Well, if it feels good. Can you imagine that? If it feels good, it's right. Since when feelings make a decision? I mean, decide. What, 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 since when feelings are deciding factors? Do you know how troublesome that is? If you happen in life, and sometimes we do. Oh, well, you know, the, what I need to achieve, whatever I do is justified by that. This principle, the end justifies the mean, is satanic principle. It's not biblical principle. And so when you listen and observe what is happening, keep in mind some of these things, how more and more our society is showing these features which tells me that we are, right now we are at a very serious point to a large degree. We are just about to get across that critical point and we, we, can, we, should be, we could be referred to as a totalitarian state. What is encouraging is that I find that, uh, uh, interestingly, that a large, uh, considerable no number of states throughout the world are stunned by the developments in our own country. So what is that idea of uh, the city and the hill, the light that is supposed to shine? To, you know, we are supposed to be, we, United States, are supposed to be a country that is desirable to go through. Now people will really say, wait a minute, what's happening here? So, 
The times are serious, but the Lord is coming. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Markovic, for that very sobering assessment of where we are in history. I would encourage you, before it disappears from the internet, to some research on the Chinese Cultural Revolution, see the suffering that went along with it, the principles that were involved. Uh, history does repeat itself, and it seems to me that we're almost on the verge of a similar cultural revolution in our state, in our country here as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Markovic. Thank you for sharing us the lessons of history. And um, our next presentation is uh, through three gentlemen here. And uh, when we were talking on our Religious Liberty Committee about this topic, about our Religious Liberty Sabbath, um, the, the question arose, you know, what, what are we going to do our afternoon seminars on? And uh, we decided to, to talk about the suppression of free speech in social media. Now, this was back in September. Who would have imagined that we are today where we are with the suppression of free speech? So um, we have a panel here. We have Pastor Michael Kasarwama. We have Brother Ron Knott um, from Andrews University Seminary Studies, uh, the publishing department. And we also have Brother Troy Homanchuk, who has a keen interest in this topic. And they're going to be sharing with us um, some insights as to what is happening today with deplatforming and canceling and the trends within social media. So, um, brothers, do you, want, do you want to move this behind you? Good afternoon, as Dr. Vine has said. Our topic is social media, censorship, and religious liberty. And as he indicated, when our committee selected this early in the fall, we knew it was a large and sobering topic. The beginnings of a dark cloud could be seen on the horizon, um, noticeable by anyone concerned about liberty. But still, while there have been rumblings, the storm was mostly in the distance. And then this past week, it seems a storm has broken upon us, and it is likely to be with us for a long time. I don't think, um, well, I'll say it this way. As, uh, I'll simply say as presenters, we readily acknowledge, particularly with the fast pace of events in the last few days, that we really don't have a full and good handle on it. I don't think anybody does. It's too big. We don't have a solid place to put our foot or a solid vantage point for perspective. We are, have we been dumped down in the middle of a bunch of trees and it's impossible to really understand the forest, but we will do the best we can. My name is Ronald Knott, a member here at the Village Church and director of Andrews University Press, the primary academic publishing house to serve the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am not a social media user. Never have been, rather perversely proud of that, but I am married to someone who is a very active user of Facebook for mission and inspiration. Here is Michael Kusarawana. Michael is assistant pastor here at the Village Church, specializing broadly, very broadly, in video and social media communication, among many other things in this church, and in the sense that a professional is someone who earns his living by doing a particular thing. Pastor Michael is a professional on our topic today. And then at the far table is Troy Homanchuk, an architectural designer, a keen observer of and active user of social media for many years until he recently took an extended break from it while he evaluates how best to use it. So, of course, because I know the least about our topic, I naturally get to be the moderator. And Troy, you're going to start us off. Yeah, let's begin with some scripture. Um, in Acts 4, verses 18 to 20, it says, So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Before we can actually begin a discussion on our topic, we need some definitions. And so, uh, Michael, 
What is social media? So social media is, um, is a computer-based platform or digital-based platform that has taken something that we used to do on a daily basis, which is to interact and communicate and share information. But now it's being done online on the internet and digitally. So these platforms that we know, for example, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, the list is endless. These were viewed in the past as just platforms, but now we're realizing that they're shifting to go into publishers. So basically, social media is the platform that is used to interact, to share information and communicate. Thank you, Michael. All right, religious liberty. We think that's an easy one, but let's just have a little refresher course. Our understanding in this country of religious liberty, of course, comes from the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. And you may recall from your high school civics class that the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are called the Bill of Rights. But those 10 amendments provide for more than 10 rights, and the First Amendment itself contains five big ones. And it might be helpful to actually read the First Amendment. And you can see what it says here. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What a beautiful phrase. What an astoundingly beautiful phrase in the history of civilization. Or of abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government to a redress of grievances. All of these, by later precedents, are essentially applied through all government jurisdictions, state, county, city, town, and public institutions. You will quickly note that religious freedom can be directly affected by at least three of the other freedoms in these first beautiful few words in the Bill of Rights. And uh, religious freedom can be affected, of course, by freedom of speech. It can be affected by freedom of the press. And as we have learned in the recent pandemic, freedom of assembly. Troy, tell us about censorship. Well, I can't tell you all about it, but I think it's one of those things we sort of intuitively um, understand. Uh, but there are some characteristics to it. Um, uh, censorship in general is, is the suppression or the banning or deletion of speech, um, writing, images, anything that's considered um, indecent or obscene or otherwise objectionable. Um, now, in the US, censorship really only becomes a civil rights issue when our government suppresses ideas. Um, or the expression of, of ideas or other information. Um, uh, now, there is such a thing as protecting, um, say, you know, children from inappropriate themes, um, but there's certainly a very powerful nature to uh, limiting expression um, or, or uh, sort of the consumption of ideas. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning when we're talking about censorship that uh, even if your First Amendment rights um, uh, for free speech aren't being violated by the government, you can still be subjected to censorship by um, individuals or uh, private businesses. So even if you freely agree to, uh, for example, um, YouTube, if you go on there, there's, uh, as you sign up for a Gmail account, there's a terms of service agreement. Um, but what people are finding more and more is that uh, with these terms of service agreements, they, they vary in, uh, so widely. The interpretation is, is uh, very open, uh, they seem to change uh, their definitions constantly, um, that uh, the, the sort of, um, uh, they're, they're applied, I guess, unevenly across the user base. Um, and so when you see this kind of thing, you can, you can uh, be sure that censorship is at play. And so it even happens when you're not aware of it, um, such as if you go to do a Google search, um, there are certain things that Google is not afraid to uh, openly admit that they will not uh, provide you with, um, with information on. Uh, and so um, in this way, they sort of, uh, it's called shadow banning, where the information is out there, but you can't find it. Uh, so that's, that's also a form of censorship. What we're learning, of course, is that this is a serious and a sober topic, but I'd like to begin 
with something a little more on the lighthearted side as an illustration of censorship. And uh, it has to do with Facebook. Now, <clears throat> my wife is a very active user of Facebook, as I mentioned, for ministry, for inspiration, and sometimes gentle humor, and oftentimes pictures of the beautiful salads that she creates. Many users of Facebook are familiar with website security features that require us to click certain boxes in a grid to prove that we are not robots. And here's an example on the screen. These uh, devices or these images are called CAPTCHAs. And uh, as you can see here, it's a program or system intended to distinguish human from machine input. And these security devices, and most of you probably have interacted with them, are a process, an interface you have to go through before you're allowed to proceed on a site. And oftentimes they're set up in this way. And you can see this one asks the user to select all images that have an orange in them. And so you can see that there's two or three uh, images on the screen that have an orange in them, and the user would be required to click on each of those pictures, and if they click correctly, they are allowed to proceed into the site. So, Esther came across an interesting meme, kind of a joke about a CAPTCHA. And here's one that is set up, and mind you, it was intended as a joke, and it says, select all of the squares containing a dishwasher. Now, if you look at it closely, you can see that there's a young woman kneeling next to a dishwasher, and she's apparently either loading it or unloading it, and uh, the witty person who uh, created this meme thought it would be interesting to provide some humor by clicking all of the pictures that contain a portion of the woman and leaving the actual dishwasher out of the picture. So, Esther thought that was kind of funny, and uh, so she posted it one Saturday evening on Facebook. Well, that was too much for Facebook. Too much for the humorless enforcers of doctrine at Facebook. Bam, you can see the note at the bottom. This post goes against our community standards on hate speech, so no one else can see it. Now, those of you that know Esther know that she's not likely to take something like that sitting down, and so, of course, she appealed. I never would have thought of appealing, but, of course, Esther is a persistent one, and she appealed. And so Facebook sent back the message saying, you requested a review, so someone will be taking another look at this post. No one else can see this post while it's in the review. And so she waited patiently, and eventually uh, she got an answer. And it said, we have reviewed your post again, and it doesn't follow our community standards on hate speech. No one else can see this post. Now, please remember that this wasn't posted by some male chauvinist. It was posted by dear, sweet Esther, who, I might remind you, ironically, has been a true pioneer for more than 30 years, not by rhetoric, but by loving service in our church's move toward equality of men and women serving in pastoral ministry. And I assure you that once in a while at our home, I have emptied the dishwasher. But Facebook, nevertheless, thought that this was, hate, or is, hate speech. Now let that sink in for a moment, hate speech. Wouldn't you like to meet the human mind who, on appeal, had to interact with this and nevertheless still say this is hate speech? If Facebook were listening, and I sort of hope it is, I would simply say, my young friend, do you have any idea of the amusement, the ridicule, the opprobrium, look it up, with which your action is viewed by any person of normal sense over the age of 35? Now, a few years ago, I might have said over the age of 25, but I recognize that maturity rates have gone down. Now, I would like you to note the funny irony of the meme that she had posted beside it. Now, you can't read it very well, but it's a picture of a garbage truck. 
And the garbage truck has a slogan on the side. You can't read it, but I'm going to read it for you. And the slogan written there on the side said, satisfaction guaranteed, or double your garbage back. Well, Esther wasn't satisfied with Facebook, and sorry for putting it so bluntly, she got double the garbage back. Michael, could you turn our minds to scripture? All right, our next scripture is going to be from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. Do we have a slide? for? Whoops. We don't. I'm going to read it from, from the front here. Oh, right there. It says here, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. So, there has been a sudden awareness in popular culture of big tech's movement toward censorship of various kinds. Before we go any farther, could I ask one of the two of you to uh, define this phrase that we are hearing uh, much more, particularly in the last week, big tech? All right, big tech uh, goes beyond just social media. It also includes companies that um, manufacture electronic devices like Apple, and um, Microsoft, but in context with the subject that we are discussing, I'll go back to some of the examples that I had given before, like Google, Facebook, um, TikTok, Twitter. So these are the companies that are that um, controlling, or let's say, these are big companies on the social media um, platforms. So they are often referred to as big tech. Thank you, Michael. Now. As we mentioned, we are seeing, we're hearing so much about the big tech movement toward censorship of various kinds, and we thought that we would uh, prevent, present a few um, one or two sentence or one or two or three sentence case studies uh, or illustrations, and not necessarily quite as lighthearted as the one I presented about Esther. And we're going to try to run through these uh, quickly and not get tedious, but uh, Troy, would you start us off? Sure. Uh, starting our list, uh, right in November 2020, just after the election, uh, a New York Times columnist demanded that Facebook censor stories about election irregularities. The next one, we see it from October last year in 2020. GoFundMe canceled a fundraising effort for billboards about the dangers of transgenderism. In November of 2020, Mail Ch MailChimp canceled a newsletter sent to subscribers who were attempting an or to organize a protest about election results. Uh, also in November 2020, uh, Twitter began regularly labeling or sidelining opinion tweets about the results of the election long before the election was even certified. It looks like we have a lot from November. In that same month, November 2020, at the US Senate hearings, on November 18, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg, under strong questioning, could not deny that Facebook uses a system to communicate with their counterparts, which are Twitter and Google, and then enter those companies' suggestions for censorship so that Facebook can then follow up with them and effectively coordinate their censorship efforts. Again in November, long before the national election results were legally certified, YouTube openly and without any embarrassment announced that it would remove videos questioning a victory by one of the candidates. Also, in October, Facebook and Twitter both openly acknowledged that they worked to reduce the distribution of major news stories about corruption investigations into the activities of the son of one of the presidential candidates. Now, those were true stories. There were investigations. And it reminds us of um, a witticism someone came up with recently that says, journalism means covering an important story with a pillow until it stops moving. <laughs> and by the way, a poll conducted after the election found that 17% of the respondents claimed that if they had been aware of those stories about the candidate's son's son, they would have changed their vote. Well, back in July of 2020, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube canceled a video of a medical organization's Capitol Hill press conference about COVID misinformation. 
And the day it was posted on Facebook, it was the most watched video in the world until all three platforms canceled it at once. In June of that same year, in 2020, Zoom executives and technicians in China and the US terminated a Zoom meeting hosted by a Chinese human rights group to commemorate the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. Last July, LinkedIn, the popular professional networking site, removed a post linking to a new scientific paper on global temperatures published by the CO2 Coalition. The paper was titled the, Glean, the Global Mean Temperature Anomaly Record, and it was written by two leading scientists on world temperatures. It attempted to put the modest, what they called the modest 1.2 degree rise in temperature since 1900 in its proper perspective. LinkedIn didn't want its users to know about it. Also in July, uh, GoFundMe took down a campaign to raise money for a video information campaign to challenge the science behind Anchorage, Alaska's COVID mask mandate. Now, if I can find it, and uh, Mr. Freeman in the balcony, you may have to help me. I think I need to go back one slide, and I'm not exactly sure how to do that. If you could help me. Oh, yes. This one is older, but it is almost funny and representative of a large number of similar actions by major platforms. A woman by the name of Kaylee Triller Haver had a, uh, received a seven-day suspension from Facebook on her professional Facebook account for posting a picture of a sign that had been put on the door of a women's restroom in a synagogue, uh, and, and the sign dealt with privacy issues. The sign read, and I'm not sure you can read it from there, it says, we sympathize with those experiencing a gender identity crisis. But please understand that in order to establish a safe environment in the synagogue in line with Torah values, only biological females from birth are permitted to use this restroom. And then it says, if you are not a biological female from birth and you are reading this sign, please seek qualified professional help. Well, of course, Facebook uh, gave her a seven-day suspension for posting that, but she received many, as she said, expletive-laden and threatening comments by trans activists, as she described them, which Facebook did not censor for violating community standards. And when she posted a video album of those comments, and I looked at a few of them, and at least as many as I could stand, and she was very right in describing them vile and vicious, when she posted a video album on those after her seven-day suspension, pointing out that these are the kinds of things that Facebook does not censor or say violates community standards. Facebook shut down her site. Now all these uh, case studies or these examples that we see may look like they're from 2020. And if you have been observing the news or following closely, you might be knowing that last week there's quite a lot that happened. So now we transition to um, events that happened last week pertaining to social media. So last Monday, Monday of last week, Libertarian U.S. Representative from Texas, Ron Paul, father of the U.S. Senator Rand Paul, posted an article on Monday on his Facebook page, critical of big tech stunning moves over the weekend to censor content and shut down conservative sites and alternative platforms. Facebook immediately locked Paul out of his own account or page, saying he had repeatedly violated Facebook's community standards, though without identifying any offending content. And I would like to follow up just briefly on that. Facebook did have some follow-up and shortly afterwards said, oh, we made a mistake. Well, those of you that pay attention to such issues are well aware that the, oh, we made a mistake, happens very, very often and almost exclusively from one direction. Hmm. I'll have to remember that next time I get caught doing something. Um, perhaps the biggest news from last week, the U.S. president was banned from all social media platforms. Um, meanwhile, accounts that outright threaten the U.S., such as Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, in which he tweets that he will definitely strike a martyrdom blow to the U.S., is still active, as are numerous 
uh, Communist China and Venezuelan uh, uh, dictators' accounts. And something that um, hit home to me, because I have family that is in, in, um, in developing countries, is something that happened in the past few weeks with WhatsApp. For those who don't know WhatsApp, because it's not that popular in the US, it's a messaging app that uh, you use to communicate over the internet. You can video call, you can voice call. But recently, they say they updated, updated their terms of service. Now they will be able to share the information they had promised that they were not going to share with Facebook. And this is going to be in the future related to censorship as well. Well, so the question is, well, if big tech is banning free speech, then someone should just come up with an alternative platform. And so this is what uh, people have been doing. And uh, there are platforms such as Parler, um, and this is a story that is ongoing. Um, Parler is the name of a service, an app, um, that is a kind of direct competitor to Twitter. Um, and very recently, uh, shortly after the president was banned from all social media platforms, uh, Twitter being his favorite, favorite one, um, it was reported that he was going to move over to Parler. Um, and in the wake of events uh, in Washington, uh, Big Tech used this as a premise for attacking Parler. Um, that's my characterization of it, at least. Uh, besides the app being removed from the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store, um, Amazon Web Services dropped Parler from their servers, uh, citing a failure to adequately censor material appearing on the platform uh, hosted on their servers. Uh, despite Parler actively removing um, actionable calls for violence, uh, AWS, or uh, Amazon Web Service, uh, still felt that it wasn't happening fast enough and service was indefinitely suspended. Uh, so there is, there is, uh, I believe, an injunction to reverse this action, uh, citing antitrust violations. Um, AWS, um, by the way, also hosts Twitter, uh, the direct competitor to Parler, and it should be noted that uh, recently a uh, AWS and Twitter just uh, signed a multi-year contract um, and that despite similar material appearing on Twitter, it was only Parler that was receiving uh, these same punishments from Amazon Web Services. And that's part of what this, uh, um, I don't know if it's considered a lawsuit, but it's an injunction, uh, deals with, uh, with the antitrust issues. Uh, so with that and the removal of their app, and Big Tech has effectively removed them and millions of voices from the internet. So uh, this is the result of creating an alternative platform. And of course, with the other very surprising events of this week, we could go on and on and on, as we probably already have. We have another passage of scripture, if we can bring it up on the screen. I'm not sure, it'll maybe take just a moment to be able to do that. Uh, yes, we do. And Michael, would you take us through that, please? Yes, our next scripture is going to be from Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 3 and verse 6. And this scripture is going, is going to put in context what we are doing this afternoon. We're not just try and scare those who use social media, but we are being messengers of the Lord. So let's uh, read verse 4 and verse 6. It says here, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. So we are pretty much in the place of being messengers of God to warn the people. In the context of what we have been discussing here, we naturally think, what does this mean for us, for each of us? And what does it mean for our message? What does it mean for the gospel message? What does it mean for Adventist doctrine? In the current environment and the environment that it appears we are moving more darkly into, is there a threat specifically to areas of the gospel message and Adventist doctrine that will be vulnerable to attack. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, probably the most fundamental to uh, all Christians, uh, especially us, uh, is Christ as the only name. Uh, if you look at Acts 4.12, uh, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given by mankind by which we must be saved. Uh, and in a culture where there is no moral authority uh, over us, but we get to choose what we believe for ourselves and a sort of all religions lead to, lead to heaven type of uh, mentality, um, I think that's, uh, that's pretty offensive to say something like that. Um, and furthermore, why do we need to be saved? Um, you know, our, how dare you suggest that I'm, uh, I'm sinful or, or less than you? And, and uh, you know, after all, there are no right or wrong choices. There's just different choices. So uh, suddenly the very name of Jesus uh, is hate speech and uh, failing to endorse all these life choices. And I think the most fundamental aspect of the good news for sinful mankind is suddenly now the most offensive thing to, for sinful mankind. Very, very much related to that is, of course, the concept of evangelism itself. More and more, evangelism, that is both the concept and the activity, will likely be viewed negatively. To evangelize means to share something, in this case, the good news of Jesus Christ, with grace and with fervor and with passion that you believe is true and that you wish the other person to accept as true. And in a culture, as Troy has alluded to, where truth is reduced to preferences, an argument for objective truth, as evangelism certainly is, will be viewed first as arrogant and then as intrusive and then divisive and then demeaning and offensive and then, because it posits a choice between heaven and hell, ultimately hateful. Paul says those who live a godly life will suffer persecution. And other areas of our gospel or the message that God has given us that would be subject to censorship in the near future will be Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 13, and Revelation chapter 14. Now, in chapter 13, we know that there's a first beast and the second beast. And the first beast, according to the Bible, as we know the symbols of prophecy, it shows that the first beast is the papacy. And now you can see with uh, the subjects that Vatican is pushing, a lot of people, they are getting on board with, uh, with the papacy. So if you show that he is the man of sin, like Paul says, you're going to be in the category of hate speech. And also in Revelation chapter 14, you're saying Babylon, Babylon is fallen, and when you identify Babylon as the papacy or the Vatican, of course, you're going to fall under hate speech. So these are the things that we should take into consideration and put into context of all the, the examples that we've given before that we will be part of these people that are not going to have the free speech. The doctrine of humanity certainly will be an easy target. There are several theological elements to what we call biblical anthropology, including, of course, the mortal nature of the human being in relation to eternity. Where did we come from and what happens when we die? But the key element of biblical anthropology and human understanding for 6,000 years that is being contested is contained in that famous phrase, male and female created he them. In recent years, and then in recent months, and in very recent days, there has been an enormous effort to deface or erase this most basic element of human existence. As I noted in my offering appeal this morning, the US House of Representatives last week decided to eliminate words that denote gender from its internal rules and communications. And they treated it as something to be celebrated. This is not just blaring virtue signaling, but an open invitation to all government entities to do the same thing. When our national legislative body takes such a breathtaking leap, how easily justified will it be for big tech to take the next natural progressive step to eliminate such language on their platforms and denounce it as hate speech? We will have no reason to be surprised. Now when, now when, okay. Go ahead. Now when one is hearing all these things, they might say, 
So I need to get off social media today and close all my accounts and leave. But as we read from Ezekiel, this is a warning. So what are we supposed to do when we know that our privileges are going to be taken away very soon? We must utilize the platform where people are. There are billions and billions of people that are using social media that we can only reach through the internet. I would like to give an example that was mentioned by Pastor Kelly in one of his recent sermons. The came meeting that we had, we had thousands of people tuning in and they were blessed by the came meeting. Thousands and thousands that we couldn't have reached if we're just having came meeting here. They couldn't come from different countries, from different places, even different states here in the United States. So what are we saying? Let us utilize the internet whilst it's, it lasts. And let us know that this privilege is going to be taken away from us. And if you have a social media account, use it. Post Bible verses. Uh, some can go live. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, the terms that are used or the, the terminology that is used on social media, you can go live and you can share promises. You can share an encouragement. You can actually share the, the programming that we put out here at Village Seven Day Adventist Church. For example, Recently, I started a devotional that I'm going through the 74th chapter of the Desire of Ages, which is Gethsemane. So I've been doing that every night. Part of my devotion, I'm just inviting other people from different countries and uh, different places to join me. And guess what? Those devotionals, they've been getting over 200 views every single night. So... This is just for my own personal account. So if you have an account, if you have TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, now there's Signal, there's Telegram, and different, different alternatives. So if you have an account, try and see, ask the Lord how effectively you can use it to spread the gospel whilst the privilege still lasts. So Michael, am I correct in understanding that uh, YouTube was helpful was responsible for our ability to reach those thousands of people for camp meeting. Is yes, that correct? we are streaming to both YouTube and Facebook. And Facebook. Yes. So, uh, so it would be very appropriate to say thank the Lord for YouTube and thank the Lord for Facebook and maybe at the same time God save us from YouTube and save us from Facebook. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> As Michael has said, there still is a great deal that we can do with social media. But what we are seeing reminds us that, and it has been touched on already, that uh, we may also need to seriously be considering some alternatives. Some of them may be new, some of them may be very old. Pastor uh, Vine referred to some of those this morning, and uh, Troy, would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, as a tool, social media uh, is still something that we can, we can use, um, even if it's for the next day, but um, we can still use it. Um, and, and even as we are spreading the gospel um, interpersonally um, through texting and, and that sort of thing, um, you can begin to use um, encrypted apps like um, Signal, um, for having groups that you can uh, uh, share, like maybe a, a virtual small group with. Um, you, can, you can even do your searches online um, using DuckDuckGo, um, use a VPN. And if you don't understand what I'm talking about, that's okay. Just think about um, things that, that we all understand. So radio, right? Um, remember the days before internet. Um, Radio is a big one. We we re, we relay Adventist radio here at Village, and um, I'm a big supporter of eight, well, a big support. I support uh, Adventist World Radio. But uh, after uh, Pastor Vine's um, challenge uh, regarding what we do with our finances right now, uh, while we still have finances, uh, maybe I should become a larger supporter of our Adventist World Radio. Um, but this is an effective tool. Radio gets to, to people who don't even have internet, um, who don't regularly use social media anyways. Um, CDs and DVDs, we have a DVD ministry here. There are DVDs that are gonna be available um, just outside um, uh, from today's uh, pr presentations. Um, DVDs are effective um, also where internet is scarce. Um, and let's not forget print. Uh, this was also touched on, uh, Pastor Vine talked about um, 
you know, books, glow tracks. Um, it doesn't take anything to just leave a glow track with somebody. Um, uh, Ron, you, you know a lot about books. Um, this, is, this is something that's uh, still an effective way of spreading the gospel. Um, even snail mail. Uh, you know, if we wanted to, we could um, uh, take the recordings of this session, put them on a thumb drive, um, put a, a, a mail, a P.O. box mailing address. Um, people could um, write into us or we could send them something. I mean, there, there's all sorts of ways. Um, but I think another one to remember is just developing personal relationships with people. And yes, it's maybe a little bit challenging with some during these times of COVID, but um, there's always somebody you can get together with, um, you know, people at work. Uh, but but there are alternatives to social media. Uh, but meanwhile, while it's still usable, we should be using it for the gospel. Uh, maybe less for selfies, uh, more for the gospel. <laughs> well, I should mention one other one. Uh, the fax machine. <laughs> I'm, oh, yes, I'm, thank I'm, you very much, I'm predicting much, it's going to make a comeback, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that one plays out. <laughs> For a period of my life, I was almost entirely dependent professionally on a fax machine, and so I have a very, very sentimental place in my heart for fax machine. And uh, because you're just dealing with a telephone line, it isn't quite as susceptible to some of the other concerns that we're talking about and intrusions from big tech, so to speak. We have another passage of scripture on our screen, and Troy has alluded to it beautifully. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me or who sent us. Night is coming when no one can work. Some last thoughts, Troy and Michael. Yeah, well, um, for all the events that have happened uh, surrounding social media, surrounding censorship, um, you know, violations of the First Amendment, uh, it's very discouraging. And yet I'm encouraged. Um, I'm encouraged because I believe in the Bible promises. Um, I have overcome the world. That's a big one. Um, you know, and so even though night is coming, um, we, we still have some work to do, and we can do it, and we should take advantage of it and um, use the energy that we have um, and, uh, and, and utilize social media as, as a tool for the gospel while we still can. Amen. Uh, for me, I would like to go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. There's nothing new under the sun. What has been, it shall be. And that ties into the text that we opened with, which was telling us about the disciples when they were told that you shouldn't speak about this name or you shouldn't heal in this name. The disciples followed God and they didn't follow men. So we see that they were censored if we want to use that term, but we are to learn from what they did. They prayed to God, they were wise, they were led by the Spirit, but they didn't stop. When they were persecuted from one city, they went to another. So thank you, Troy, for enlightening us for, uh, about the alternatives that we can use. But soon, all those alternatives, they're going to be eliminated one by one, and we're going to be left with a few. But God has given us his spirit, and we are praying for the latter rain, for God to be able to direct us each and every day. So he has said in the Bible more than 365 times, fear not, fear not, fear not. So even if the armies are coming, like the armies that came after Jehoshaphat, our prayers and dependence in God is going to help us to be successful and to finish the work. There have been a lot of expressions in the media this last week on this very topic, uh, considering the top executives that run so-called big tech. And the term masters of the universe have been used frequently in relation to them. And the most obvious conclusion that we can come to is while the executives of big tech may somehow think and believe that they are the masters of the universe. Our God is on his throne.
All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. That was a very insightful uh, conversation on what is happening in social media, uh, with social media platforms these days, uh, which brings us to our final uh, presentation for today. And uh, this will be my privilege to give. So if I could ask our gentleman, can you bring the, the um, pulpit forward for me? That'd be very helpful, thank you. And I'll pick this up here as well. <clears throat> so it's been, a, it's been a long day so far. I hope it's been a blessing for everybody. We've been talking about sobering issues. Uh, we're moving beyond the froth of the entertainment-based world in which we live, and we're considering some hard realities that are facing our world. I, uh, I want to thank uh, our gentlemen here who have been serving with our Religious Liberty Committee uh, for their care and their thoughtfulness in putting their presentation together. And um, I want to thank Todd up there with the AV team for keeping us going through today, through the Sabbath. And I'm going to be talking about a topic this afternoon which is, uh, can be very emotive, can be very difficult, um, but it is part of the, the milieu in which we find ourselves today. And I think it is important that we do address it um, because sooner or later it's going to affect us. If it may not affect us now, but certainly our children are being marinated in these kind of uh, thinkings, these kind of ideologies that are around us these days. And so it's important that we understand um, the, the basics of what is being discussed and how do we respond to it from a biblical basis. Uh, because we are called to represent Jesus Christ, who loves all people, who died that all people might be saved, and who did not come to divide this world, but in order that all might be saved. And so uh, I'm going to be talking this afternoon in our last talk. It's called Wrong Think 3. Um, this is definitely not in harmony with the new think that is driving our world today. Uh, but in Wrong Think 3, I'm going to be discussing the issue of critical race theory. You've probably heard the phrase critical race theory bandied about. I'm going to be discussing today um, what are the basic tenets of a critical race theory, the basic beliefs, um, what are some of the criticisms of critical race theory, and uh, some of the biblical framework. How do we respond to this issue such as critical race theory? It's important as well that as, as we talk about these things, that we're speaking here from the perspective of the kingdom of God, not from any partisan and political perspective here today. Um, when we talk about losing social media, um, this affects everybody. Just because it affects one side more than the other doesn't deny the reality that one day everybody may be affected by this. Uh, we do not uh, support any kind of law-breaking as Christians. We are called to honor the laws of land in which we live insofar as they uphold and honor the law of God. We are to call to obey God rather than man, but we're also called to be the best as possible citizens. And so it is important for us to recognize that, for instance, violence in our streets over the last year we utterly abhor, including the violence at the state capitol just this last week. We do not stand by or applaud or secretly wink-wink at people who seek to invade the, the, the Capitol building, those who seek to burn buildings to the ground. We want this to be a nation of law-abiding of law citizens where all people have a ch an opportunity to flourish, all people have equality before the law and equal opportunity, and all people have the chance to live out their dreams. And so we're speaking uh, during this religious liberty Sabbath from the perspective of the kingdom of God and not from any partisan political perspective and I hope it's not interpreted in any other way. So let's bow our heads and ask for God's blessing upon us as we touch upon this difficult topic. Dear Heavenly Father, I wanna thank you that you created the human race in your image, that the, uh, the Asian and the African and the European and the American and the, the, the Eskimo and uh, every part of the wonderful, incredible diversity of the human family is every part of that is created in your image. The Father, I thank you that we can learn from each other more about you. I thank you, Father, that as we walk with each other and share with each other and learn from each other and pray with each other and serve one another, that we can magnify the image of God in our own lives. Lord, as I pray, I pray, Lord, that as I share these thoughts today, I pray that your spirit will lead me and guide me, that you'll watch over every word that comes from my tongue. I pray, Father, for those who are listening, that they will hear not me, but the spirit speak into their hearts. Father, we thank you for those watching at home, online. We pray your blessing upon them, and wherever they are scattered around the world. I ask, Lord, that as a result of this religious liberty Sabbath, our witness for you will burn brighter, our love for you will be truer, our faith will be deeper, and our walk will be stronger. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. All right, so if I were to ask you what is the most important thing in your life, what would it be? 
Um, good question. Uh, some people will say, maybe it's my boat, maybe it's my car. And um, I see Brooks raising his hand back there. I'm not sure what's for you. All right, so, yeah, so the most important thing for many people is their children. And we do anything for our children. Our children are a gift from God, and we are stewards of that gift from God, prayerfully leading our children into the kingdom of God. And as such, their education is very important to us. How our children are educated, what they hear in their education, the ideologies that surround their education are very, very important. And make no mistake, education has an underlying ideology. Education is never within a vacuum. Dr. Andrea Luxon, the president of Andrews, correctly stated it. She said, I think Adventist education is more important than ever. Why? Because education is never in a vacuum. There's always underlying ideologies that drive what happens in a school or university. And I would agree with every word that Dr. Luxton says there. There is always an underlying ideology driving what happens uh, beh behind the education of our children. And if we're concerned about our children's eternal salvation, we need to be concerned about the ideologies that impact their education. And so, as, I, as we go through today, I want to suggest that just because you are called an Adventist school does not mean you are providing an Adventist education per se. You must examine critically the underlying ideology to see where is this ideology coming from and what is it saying. So as we talk about critical race theory, we'll start out by saying, well, what exactly is critical race theory? It's always good to get some definitions so we know what we're talking about. Critical race theory was developed by um, the first tenured African-American law professor at Harvard. His name was Professor Derek Bell, Jr. Uh, he, was rega he is regarded as the originator of critical race theory. And his ideas have evolved over the last 30 years and now propagated by very well-known individuals in the American literary scene. You've probably heard of a writer called Robin DiAngelo, who wrote a very famous book just recently called White Fragility, Why It's So Hard for White People to Talk About Racism. And if you haven't heard of Robin DiAngelo, now you have. Then you have the revisionist history of the New York Times' 1619 Project, which argues that America began not with the revolution, but with the first African slave coming to America, and that Africa was essentially designed to perpetuate and propagate the enslavement of African peoples. Then you have um, the, um, Abraham, X, Abraham X. Kendi, who wrote a very, very famous book. He's a professor in Boston called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And that phrase, anti-racist, in the year 2020 took on a whole new meaning. We'll discuss that uh, shortly. Then you have Ta-Nehisi Ta Coates, who wrote a book called Between the World and Me, and Delgado and Stefanich, who wrote a book called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. These are very, very popular books today. Uh, D'Angelo's book, um, White Fragility, um, passes through many Adventist hands. I've seen it. I've seen it on people's shelves. People recommend it to me. Um, it's been on the New York Times bestsellers list for months now. It's a very, very common book that's kind of permeating through the American consciousness and the American thinking uh, population. So according to Britannica, so there you are, those are some of the key critical race theory writers there. According to uh, Britannica, um, an online definition or dictionary, this is definition of critical race theory. Now, there are different definitions, but I think this is about as workable a definition as we could look for it. Critical race theory is the view that the law and legal institutions are inherently racist, and that race itself, instead of being biologically grounded and natural, is actually a socially constructed concept that is used by white people to further their economic and political interests at the expense of people of color. That is, critical race theory argues that, um, that race is actually a social construct rather than grounded in any other reality. According to critical race theory, racial inequality emerges from the social, economic, and illegal differences that white people create between races, races to maintain elite white interests in labor markets and politics, giving rise to poverty and criminality in many minority communities. This then is a, a functional definition of critical race theory uh, that we're going to be basing today's discussion on. Now, critical to understanding critical race theory is understanding the difference between equity and equality. Equity in critical race theory is the idea that society produces policies that produce equal outcomes for all ethnic groups, such as everybody lives the same period of time, everybody has the same standard of income, etc., etc. And that is opposed and in rejection of the liberal principle of equality, such as equality before the law, equality of process, equality of opportunity, 
and, and so forth. And so whereas the, the liberals of the 1700s, 1800s, and 1900s would push for equality, um, that is now rejected as being intrinsically racist. So some of the key tenets of critical race theory are as follows. Firstly, uh, critical race theory argues for the permanence of systemic racism, that racism is entrenched in every social structure within the United States. Racism and critical race theory is a relentless fact of life, so entrenched and enmeshed in society that it appears ordinary to people within that culture. Secondly, um, whiteness is property. Whiteness is something that you possess. All whites, according to critical race um, theorists, are complicit in racist, racism because they possess whiteness as a political caste and they benefit from the systemic racism that maintains their socioeconomic dominance. And so whiteness is property. It's not just the color of your skin, it's like a, like a caste that you have. Uh, Oprah Winfrey has given extensive discussions on whiteness as property. Then counter storytelling. <clears throat> this is an important part of critical race theory. What does it mean? Well, critical race theory challenges the experience of white European Americans as being the normative standard for society, such as punctuality, being on time to work, and supporting one's nuclear family are now viewed as being ideas of white supremacy, and they are to be rejected in favor of other ways of living. Critical race theory promotes storytelling by oppressed minorities to challenge the dominant white supremacy and the social construction of race. The fourth major tenet of critical race theory is a rejection of the Enlightenment. According to Delgado, a very famous critical race writer, critical race theory, quote, questions the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, Enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law, end quote. Critical race theory thus rejects standardized testing in schools, it rejects the concept of meritocracy, it rejects colorblindness, it rejects equality before the law, it rejects the idea that the government strives to give everybody equal opportunity, it rejects the concept of legal reasoning or science or rationality or mathematics or science, it rejects the neutrality of constitutional law, all of which, in critical race theory, allegedly maintain this phenomenon known as white supremacy. Now, perhaps uh, most, most interestingly in this is the concept of interest convergence. And uh, this is something that is particularly applicable to, uh, to white folks who consider them more on the liberal side of the spectrum, but this, all of this affects all of us one way or another. Derek Bell came up with what he called the interest convergence hypothesis. Now, the interest co convergence hypothesis argues that advances for black people only happen when such advances are in the interests of white people. Did you hear what I say there? That means that the massive progress in race relations since the civil rights movement is therefore a myth. He argued that white people who champion the interests of black people are not doing so because they are virtuous or good. White people who champion the interests of black people are only doing so because it perpetuates their own white supremacy. And therefore, no actions by white people to promote the interests or well-being of black communities can ever be trusted for every white person is intrinsically and forever a racist. This is a very gloomy hypothesis, the interest convergence hypothesis. When you first allege that all white people are guilty of all oppression in human history, and then you say that any time a white person seeks to help someone in a marginalized community, they're only doing so to enhance their own dominance in society, uh, then you might as well have a genocide of white people because they're intrinsically only evil. They never can be doing, can be doing anything good. Critical race theory promotes historical revisionism, such as the New York Times 1619 project, the concept that America began with the arrival of the first African slaves, and America's original purpose was to maintain and exploit black slavery. The USA is thus, in critical race theory, irredeemably stained, systemically racist, by the original sin of slavery and racism, and to, perpetu and to perpetuate the United States is to perpetuate systemic racism per se. Therefore, the United States must be torn down. The United States must be torn down. When you hear Antifa chanting, and this is one of their chants, no borders, no walls, no USA at all, you know exactly where this is going. It's the dissolution of our country. Critical race theory also promotes the concept of intersectionality. The very famous black feminist scholar, Kimberly Crenshaw, is best known for the concept of intersectionality. And so in, in her writings, I've just lost my place here, 
race, gender, sexuality, and other identity markers are understood as cultural constructs rather than absolute realities, yet oppression is experienced along all of those dimensions. That is, it, there's an intersectional oppression going on. And in response, in the writings of Crenshaw, race is to be the dominant factor in all decisions across society. Critical race theory furthermore rejects the biblical principle of equality before the law. The Word of God says this in Leviticus 19.15, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor defer to the great, but you are to judge your neighbor fairly. God seeks for justice that does not really look at how rich or poor you are or, or what background you have. That is the biblical ideal of justice. And this foundational principle in the Word of God is based on the truth that everybody is created in the image of God, and therefore all have an equal intrinsic and moral value before God. And the state, in its disposition of justice, must recognize that intrinsic equality, that intrinsic human dignity before God. And so the Bible can explicitly condemns partial treatment of one group over another, such as the rich over the poor in the legal judicial system. Critical race theories focus on equity, that is equal outcomes for everybody, regardless of input, energy, hard work, talent, education, appetite for risk, or family culture, it, reje it rejects the biblical principles of equality of opportunity and personal responsibility. If someone does not work, neither shall he eat. Read 2 Thessalonians 3.10. Galatians 6.7, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For as a man soweth, so shall he reap. Critical race theory also rejects the very concept of truth. Truth in critical race theory, capital T, truth, is now considered to be a Euro-white construct that is to be rejected as intrinsically racist. There is no objective truth in critical race theory. To say that there is truth is now a racist statement. There is your truth and there is my truth, but there's no longer the truth. The truth, by definition, is a racist concept within critical race theory. Critical race theory represents a rejection of the biblical nuclear family, best exemplified in what Black Lives Matter published in their website, where they called for the dissolution of the nuclear family and children to be raised by a community. Uh, part of this is, of, is, um, is critical theory that you're looking at power dynamics. And in critical theory, a parent raising a child is an unequal power balance because a parent has more power than a child, and therefore we need to eliminate the parent's power over the child. It's called parentism. It's something that must be eliminated. And so this is one of the calls that uh, Black Lives Matter made on their website for the destruction of the nuclear family. And so we have within critical race theory, um, we have some, uh, these are some of the basic tenets of critical race theory. I want to address now some, some challenges to critical race theory. Uh, firstly, is the concept that ra racism is present in every aspect of life, in every relationship, and in every interaction. And I have no doubt, and I know this is true, but racism is alive and present in the United States. And for us to deny it is simply wrong. Racism is present. And if you don't believe that, spend some time with somebody of a different color to you and hear their experiences. Racism is present in America and it is to be condemned out of hand, period. There is no justification for it. But we must ask ourselves what we define as racism because the goalposts keep shifting by the year almost. We're gonna to come to those shifting goalposts um, shortly, shortly um, after, hereafter. Critical race theory teaches that because the USA has unequal outcomes across racial groups, that means the country must be, by definition, systemically racist. No other explanation is even possible. No other explanation is allowed. To offer any explanation other than systemic racism for unequal outcomes in society is, by definition, racist. Woke individuals, therefore, look relentlessly for the racism that must be present in every organization, in every institution, and in every relationship and looking for it wherever they can, leading inevitably to bitter division and infighting. Because tolerating racism is racist, and I would agree with that, you must call out, reject, and cancel whoever is guilty of alleged racism, even if that individual is your family member. The principle of interest convergence, as spoken by um, Professor Bell, it's a destructive construct. If anyone with what is called racial privilege, such as white, or Asian, or Hispanic, or Indian, or Arabic, or any other lighter-skinned black person, um, if they become an, an anti-racist activist, then the interest convergence hypothesis states that they only do so to maintain their own racial privilege, to flaunt their social virtue, and to avoid dealing with their own racism. So the interest convergence hypothesis makes it literally impossible 
for anyone with racial privilege to ever do the right thing. Are you following me on this? And it's interesting how we demonize certain races. The tragic events of Trevon Martin and, and Zimmerman, um, I'd never heard of this before, but during when the CNN were talking about this, they kept referring to Zimmerman, Zimmerman as being a white Hispanic. Does anybody remember that? I thought, what is a white Hispanic? I'd never heard of a white Hispanic before, but it is part of the demonization of whiteness that we call Zimmerman a white Hispanic when he really was a gentleman of Hispanic heritage. We then find that critical race theory rejects open and free societies, societies that value individual liberty, freedom of conscience, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom to gather, freedom of movement, and freedom of religion are allegedly organized to maintain white racist supremacy or hegemony over marginalized groups, and they perpetuate inequities across racial groups. And so that is why critical race theory really is dedicated to the destruction of the rights that we enjoy as American citizens of all backgrounds, such as the freedom of speech and freedom of association and freedom of conscience. Critical race theory also rejects the individual because it is Marxist ideology. And in Marxist ideology, what matters is not the individual, but the group. And in Marxist ideology, in every time and generation, certain groups are to be promoted and certain groups are to be destroyed. And if you look through the last 120 years, you will realize that in different times and different societies, Marxist ideology said this group is bad and this group is good. Uh, so for instance, in the killing fields of Cambodia, if you were a teacher, you were to be executed because you, you, you could think for yourself and the Khmer Rouge didn't want people who could think for themselves. In the Soviet Union, if you were a smallholder farmer, uh, as uh, Professor Markovich was saying, uh, in, in the collectivization process in the 30s in Ukraine, the Soviet, the Stalin decided he didn't want small farmers, they were called kulaks, and so he started on a process of what he called de-kulakization, which is we're gonna wipe out the kulaks. Millions perished, either slaughtered in the Ukraine, starved to death, or deported to Central Asia. And critical race theory has the same attitude because it's a Marxist ideology that we do not treat you as an individual on your own merits, but we treat you based on the group into which you are a part. And that group can change by the minute if you believe in sexual orientation fluidity and gender fluidity and all the rest of it being fluid as well. And so critical race theory rejects the group in favor of the rights of the individual. And so um, this is interesting because on Monday we celebrate Martin Luther King Day, do we not? And yet, why do we celebrate Martin Luther King? Because Martin Luther King is antithetically opposed to everything that critical race theory teaches. Perhaps his most famous teaching was that he longed for a day when in America, a person would be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. We've all heard that very famous st statement, yes? And I hope we can all agree by it, by God's grace, we all agree that we can judge people by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. But that idea that your skin color does not matter and you're judged by the content of your character is antithetically opposed to critical race theory which says the only thing that matters is the color of your skin and what you say or do is immaterial as an individual. So we celebrate Martin Luther King Day even though he represents uh, an understanding of racial issues profoundly opposed to critical race theory. Critical race theorists would never accept Martin Luther King today if we were on the scene. He would be condemned as being a white supremacist. Critical race theory also rejects science and mathematics. Why? Because these are allegedly white ways of knowing. It prefers storytelling and the subjective lived experience as being black ways of knowing. And there actually is a place for both, for storytelling and research, but critical race theory rejects scientific research, it rejects the scientific method, it, it rejects logic, it rejects reason, it rejects dialogue, it rejects um, pretty much everything that all of us around the world actually are familiar with in terms of under growing understanding in favor of personal storytelling. The principle of universality says it doesn't matter who does an experiment or where it takes place, the result will always be the same. But critical race theory rejects these principles, such as the principle of universality and objectivity, as being oppressive myths. Since science and math encode and perpetuate systemic racism, they are to be rejected. And the irony is we have universities all across America who preach critical race theory and they keep their math departments open, and they keep their engineering departments open, and they keep their chemistry departments open, and they keep their philosophy departments open because they should all be closed down as being expressions of white supremacy. Critical race theory declares that any who disagree are racists. 
It rejects all alternatives, such as colorblindness, as being racist. The liberal ideals of an open society, Martin Luther King's ideal that we all celebrate on Monday of judging a person by the content of their character rather than by the color of his or her skin, of working for full equality before the law, and of seeking to give everybody equality of opportunity, are now rejected as they allegedly ignore the systemic racism that requires the entire system to be destroyed. Critical race theory declares that any who disagree with it are driven by racism. You cannot have an honest disagreement. Critical race theory predetermines the lived experience of every racial group. You are either oppressed or oppressor, and it requires every member of every racial group to affirm those ideological perspectives. And when an African-American man such as Kanye West to, had the courage to leave the reservation and reject critical race theory ideology, he was publicly condemned and vilified across popular media in America as being crazy or a race traitor or just sheer out bad. If you're not following Kanye West, then you know, at least look him up and understand what happened to him. He is uh, treated as a pariah because he decided to think for himself. So to become black in America now is a political identity, first and foremost, rather than an ethnic identity. And diversity is only skin deep, for everybody's worldview must be identical in order to be acceptable to critical race theory. And critical race theory is totalitarian, and it seeks absolute power. Now, James Lindsay, a very famous writer in this area, he argues that critical race theory cannot be disagreed with, especially by black people themselves, because it rejects all, and all alternatives, and it denies all racial progress as a mirage due to the interest convergence hypothesis. Because critical race theory rejects science, it cannot be falsified or proven wrong by evidence to the contrary. And because it assumes racism is present in every situation, even the acceptance of critical race theory must somehow also be racist. Therefore, critical race theory is an insatiable beast that can never be satisfied and will tear apart anything that it comes into contact with, your marriage, your home, your church, your institution, your business, your employer, and your nation. And what we're seeing on the streets of America over the last couple of years is, that is the fruit of, this, of our young people across America being marinated in this ideology uh, for the last 10, 15 years. Does this affect Adventism? Uh, yes, it does. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the stuff that I was planning to talk about. Our time is moving on here. But I will say this. Um, before you send your children to an Adventist institution, think very carefully and examine their public statements and their, 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 um, what they're teaching. If you go to an Adventist school that commits to being a safe space, as we saw earlier today, a safe space is, is, is code for an inclusive environment. And in inclusion, as we saw in, in Wrong Think 2, our sermon of earlier today, it means that nothing can be allowed to question a student's self-identity or journey in life. If a student goes to college and thinks that he is, he is she or she is he, and uh, he thinks he wants to engage in sexual activity outside of revealed biblical morality, that must now be affirmed within that college. Nothing can be allowed to deny it or question it or even suggest that there's something wrong with it. And the call to repentance must certainly be closed down because that is hate speech. It's a microaggression because it says that something in your life is not quite right. So I'm not going to go into any further detail on that other than to say that uh, if your institution or your business declares itself a safe space, Please understand the ideological implications of this. This is the adoption of Marxist ideology at your facility. It's the adoption of Marxist teachings to, to marinate the young people in. If your university, if your business, if your employer, and this affects many of us in America today, if your business now um, talks about unconscious bias and the implicit association test from Harvard, uh, which came out some years ago, you need to be very careful about this because in the implicit association test, this seeks to identify which members you believe to be on an in-group and who you believe to be on the out-group. Now, three academics at Harvard developed the implicit association test, and two of them have now come out and said they actually disagree with its accuracy. It doesn't do what it purports to do. Unconscious bias training is rooted in the critical race theory dogma of intersectionality, and it is the concept that the West and much of the world is a deadly matrix of oppression for all except heterosexual white males. And that matrix of oppression is forever shifting, depending on how your personal identity shifts, how your gender shifts, how it's fluid, how your sexual orientation shifts by the day or month, um, your trans ideology. And this leads, nothing, leads to nothing but bitter division as different groups vie for the most oppressed group status. 
You may also have uh, an employer, or you may work for an institution or your business that may declare itself to be an anti-racist institution. And before 2020, we would say amen and amen to that because we all explicitly and intentionally and, uh, uh, disavow racism in its many forms. We'll come on to that in a few minutes. But after 2020, the phrase anti-racist, after the writings of Ibram X. Kendi, one of the best sellers of 2020, now it has a technical meaning, and we must understand anti-racist within the context of Ibram X. Kendi's writings, a very, very famous writer within America, within America today. Racism is being continually redefined and broadened to meet the increasing demands for social justice. It used to be when I was growing up that racism was understood to be prejudice of one ethnic group against another. That's what I thought racism to be, and that's what we were taught from the scriptures is fundamentally wrong and antithetical to the kingdom of God, that you cannot display prejudice or hostility from one ethnic group to another. You cannot say that one ethnic group is somehow better than another ethnic group. But the world has moved on. Then it became that racism is power plus prejudice, that you'd only, you only—you don't just have prejudice, but now you have institutional power. And because whites hold the institutional power in America, that means only whites can be racist and everybody else can never be racist. They can be prejudiced, but they can never be racist no matter what they do or say because they don't hold institutional power. That was the definition even in 2019 of racism, that racism is institutional power plus prejudice that equals racism. But the world has moved on since then, and I hope you're keeping up with these ever-changing definitions. The latest definition, as it comes from Ibram X. Kendi's book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, well, he further expands the definition of racism. And for Kendi, anti-racism means supporting and instituting policies that equalize all racial disparities across all ethnic groups, while racism consists of any policy or idea that results in racial inequity. You are either racist or anti-racist. Merely not being racist means that you are still a racist. You are not you are only not a racist if you become an anti-racist activist, pushing for a Marxist super, super state that will eliminate all policies that may inevitably or un unintentionally create unequal outcomes. To argue that disparities may have other contributing factors within society other than being the exclusive results of systemic white racism is now a racist position in and of itself. You cannot question this. Kendi ignores the fact in America today that there has never been any society that has ever accomplished equal outcomes among all groups. It has never been accomplished on any continent at any point in human history. In fact, the only real equality that was ever achieved in any society was in the concentration camps of Germany or the Soviet Union, where everybody could die equally well together. The fact that in the United States there are many ethnic groups with very significantly better socioeconomic outcomes than the white community such as the Indian Americans, the Filipino Americans, the Taiwanese Americans, the Nigerian Americans, the Japanese Americans, the Chinese Americans, Pakistani Americans, and the list goes on and on. The fact that there are many groups who have significantly higher socioeconomic outcomes than the white community, that cannot be allowed to be part of this conversation. Yet Kendi still interprets the world through a rigid white racism, black victimization binary that bears little relation to the complexities of America today as a multicultural, multi-ethnic, and multi-faith society. It seems to me that any culture or any subculture in the United States that promotes education, that values hard work, that promotes the concept of savings, that respects women and the nuclear family, and promotes the delaying of gratification for future reward, those groups within society will tend to go further than any group in society that does not hold those values. Yet as long as racial differentials exist, critical race theory systematically blames systemic racism for everything and justifies every and every measure necessary to eliminate such differentials. Anyone who questions this approach is being deplatformed and socially destroyed by being um, labeled as a racist and being canceled. And then you have the reading lists. If you look at um, the reading lists, what's being promoted in the schools, you can do this. Go and look at on the schools what their reading lists are. Look at what um, a public school or Adventist school, it matters not. Look at the books that are being promoted. Take a hard look at those reading lists because that's the ideology that will fill your children's minds. And you'll send your children to school as with a Christian or biblical worldview, and they'll come back and you kind of wonder what happened to your child. Part of it is because our children are being marinated in, in critical race theory and Marxist ideology. 
And it's incumbent upon us as parents to think very carefully about where we want our children to go and where we counsel them to go for their education. Look at the reading lists. That is a good indication of where that school is going. So what do we say in response to the challenge of racism as Christians? It's very important that we don't just condemn or crit critique, but we actually affirm something that is positive. The good news of salvation is clear that we're all created in the image of God. Every man, woman, and child on planet Earth. That each one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And God has made, and I quote, from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, Acts 17.26. We are all descended from one original family, Adam and Eve. And God sent his son into the world that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but whosoever believes in him will have eternal life, regardless of your race. We are all represented at Calvary by the three representatives of Noah's family. At the foot of the cross was Simon of Cyrene, representing Ham, or the, the African side of the human family. The Roman centurion represented Japheth, and the thief on the cross represented Shem, or the Semitic group of the, of the human family. Shem, Ham, and Japheth were united at Calvary, all in equal need of salvation, and all received salvation from Jesus Christ. And so no group has any prior claim to salvation. No ethnic group has prior ac priority access to God. And God longs to meet with the saved of the earth, drawn from every nation, tribe, language, and people on the day when all things are made new again. And so we may conclude that to espouse or uphold racist beliefs, defined as the understanding that one group is somehow inferior to another, is a totally, uh, it, is a, it is a denial of the gospel and an affront to our creator. Racism cannot be legislated out of existence despite the best uh, uh, intentions of social um, cancel culture and so forth. It cannot be suppressed through social media campaigns. It is a sin, it resides within the human heart. It may be driven out of polite public discourse, but that cannot change the human heart. And so as Christians, we are called as individuals and as a wider society to look in the mirror and to cry out with David, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love and according to your, ever, your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions, including the transgression of racism, and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Purge me with hyssop, hyssop and I shall be clean. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Search me, O God, and see if there be any, test me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting." As Christians, we are called to ask ourselves, how do we treat our brothers and our sisters? Do we treat our brothers and our sisters as God, as God would have us treat them? Do we think of our brothers and sisters' thoughts that would bring honor and glory to our Heavenly Father? Do we work for the well-being of all aspects and all, all parts of our wider community? Or are we happy to turn a blind eye when some fall behind? That is not a Christian response. We are called to work for the well-being of all parts of our community. That doesn't mean you're a critical race theorist, it means you're a Christian and you have a conscience and you recognize that all people are created in God's image. So my final thoughts are these. For parents, carefully reflect where you send your children. If those institutions are promoting critical race theory, send them somewhere else. It's not popular, but send them somewhere else. For local members, here in this church, here in Village, and around the world, for those of you watching online, pray that God will work upon the hearts of the leaders of our colleges and our schools all across the world, that they will not drink of the false gospel of critical race theory, but they will point our children to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And for the board members of our institutional educations, you're not called to be a board member so that you can fill time in your calendar. You have a sacred responsibility to ensure that the ship does not steer off course. Take your board responsibilities seriously. Ask questions and insist that if an educational institution is called Adventist, then it adheres to scripture rather than to atheist ideology. And in all that we do, let the truth be spoken in love, for we are all sinners in need of God's grace. I wanna conclude there today. This is a critical race theory is a, is a difficult issue. I've just kind of given it a very brief summary here. Um, I think that as Christians, we must be aware, we must listen to the cries of the community around us, we must respond in love, and we must work for the betterment of every aspect of our community. And we must do that in a way that honors God and God's image within our community, rather than um, promotes atheist, atheist critical race theory, because that's not, not gonna lead to anything good. 
It will just lead to further human degradation and suffering. So we come to the end today of our Religious Liberty Sabbath. It's 4.56. We were going to finish by 5, and we are almost there. I'd like to say thank you to all of you who have been with us today. It's been a privilege sharing with you. Um, thank you for coming out and supporting. For those of you watching at home, we want to say thank you as well for all you have uh, meant to us. Uh, we know we have a lot of comments coming in on social media. I'll probably take a week, then I'll take a look at those. But um, we want to thank you for watching online as well. I'd like to say thank you this afternoon to, um, to our speakers, to Dr. John Markovic. Thank you, sir, for preparing your presentation on the Chinese Cultural Revolution and its implications for Christians. We'd like to thank Pastor Michael Kosrawama and um, Troy Homanchuk and Ron Knott for your presentation on social media. Thank you for taking the time to prepare for that. We'd like to thank our village Religious Liberty Committee that's taken the time to think through these issues and to, we've reviewed this and reviewed it back and forth and what are we going to talk about. Uh, we meet quite regularly, we think what's going on in our world and I'd like to thank the members of the Religious Liberty Committee for helping to put together our annual Religious Liberty Sabbath every, every year. And beyond this though, this isn't just an event in the annual calendar of the Village Church or the North American Division. This is something that we all live with day by day. If you don't use your rights, you will lose your rights. So use your rights. Share the gospel while you may. Show God's love to somebody this week. Help somebody who is hurting. Encourage someone who is depressed. Give, some of, give someone a phone call who's feeling isolated. Use your religious liberty and demonstrate the love of God in this coming week. We don't just talk about this on a defensive posture at one Sabbath a year. I want to encourage you to live the life of Jesus, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world in this coming week, that all men may know that beyond this troubled world, there is a savior and that he's coming again. Let's bow our heads and we'll close with prayer. So dear Father, we, we thank you today for the protection of your angels. We thank you, Father, for the freedom we yet enjoy here in America for what has, uh, for this incredible gift you've given us, freedom of conscience. And Father, I pray that this liberty you've given us, we will not use it to tear each other apart, but we will use it for serving one another in love, as the Apostle Paul wrote. I thank you, Father, um, for those who've been watching online and have come to church here today. As we enter this coming week, Father, I pray that you give each one of us someone, or a family, or a neighbor, or a community that is in need of help, and Father, may we respond with love in our hearts, recognizing that this is a God-given opportunity for the love of God to flow through us to those around us. And Lord, as we minister to others, may we not be so proud that we are not open to being ministered unto ourselves. So Father, give us humble hearts, give us a sense of self-awareness, and in all we do, may the love of Jesus motivate us day by day. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. And so as we come to the end of today, I want to remind you of social distancing. By God's grace, there has been no COVID outbreak at this church during the pandemic. So please take this very seriously. Um, I think we may have a deacon at the back and we'll ask you to usher out row by row from the back, one row at a time. And you may fellowship outside in the pagoda area, but please maintain your social distancing. We have um, hand antiseptic wipe out in the foyer. Maybe wipe your hands down, socially distance, wear your masks if you're so convicted. And we look forward to seeing you either in prayer meeting this week or next Sabbath when we come together to worship. So may God bless us and walk with you in the coming week. Amen.